हेलो 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 Test, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and at the end, you have to go with me to police. Oh, I do? Okay. <laughs> because I was wondering, when I was in Goa, I had to register myself. Right. Before I, I went, I, otherwise I, could, I couldn't go back. And, and now I checked again in the visa, and this visa says again, you have to register yourself in India until 14 days of your arrival. What means that without the registration? They won't let you go back. Right. Okay. I don't know if this afternoon you will accept the possibility. No, not a problem. Let me send an entry. Okay. Because, I mean, last year, the only thing was me required was a stamp. Yes. Except for the stamp, they required the full contract at the university. Right. They had to document why I was here. And then, I mean, everything yes. had to be yes. there. But... Uh, okay. Not a problem. Let mm -hmm. me collect the police and see what's required. Okay, because, because that's... For that's you, it would have to be after um, about a month. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> with the, with the, and uh, I, I still have to go to the hotel to pick up the original because I, I have a copy, but I have to go and pick up, yes. <laughs> okay. It's better because we take all the, the, the elements there on the documents, otherwise we have to comply with different things. And I'm glad I went. I went to confirm because I had to. I told that oh to Radhika. Yes. Okay. Otherwise.
because I have to stay with you a few more days. <laughs> and it was not even here, it would be in Delhi, because they let me go until... But <laughs> Yes, no in Delhi. <laughs> I've never been, as a matter of fact, I just oh. spent some time in the airport, okay. so no more than that. Oh, well, then I have a lot of friends and family in Delhi who take good care of. <laughs> give just two minutes and then we will begin Start opening the second powerpoint let's see what I have to do in terms of time management Okay, I think we should begin because it's already almost 10 past 11. Um, so we will keep our program. Well, um, yesterday we spoke about the different directions and itineraries of the Portuguese overseas expansion. And today we are going to keep going with that, but focusing more on the East and a little bit in the Far East. As I said yesterday, you should teach me on this because <laughs> you probably know better um, the, the information, the historiography, the consequences of the, port the presence of the Portuguese in the East. But as I told from the first time as well, I'm teaching this course from the point of view of the information that I can bring from the Portuguese and European uh, historiography. Uh, so, it is clear, and we have seen it yesterday, that the uh, Portuguese overseas expansion, and that's why she's calling overseas or maritime expansion, Charles Boxer named precisely both the Portuguese and the Dutch expansion as maritime expansion, maritime empires, uh, within the idea that, in fact, more than the territorial, more than constituted by huge amount of land and territory conquests, both the Dutch and the Portuguese build their expansion and colonization and dominion over the seas. So it is clearly a maritime oriented uh, uh, expansion that brought really to Portuguese uh, in terms of the oceans in the Atlantic, uh, besides the, the Mediterranean, there were before in the Atlantic, in the Indian Ocean, and in the Pacific, 
uh, ocean. And as you can see, this is equivalent only a very small portions of land. In fact, what you see here, namely in, in the East and then in Far East, they are mostly points rather than really huge amounts of territory or land. Even here, what you see for Brazil, this is uh, uh, the line on the 18th century, after really progressively and slowly conquering land to inland, to the interior of Brazil. Because in fact, also in the 15th and 16th century, the positions in Brazil, they were uh, also oriented to the coast. So, but the first question that we try to answer when dealing with the Portuguese in India or the Portuguese in the East is when did that begin? I mean, what I mean is that what did the... So, getting a little bit back, uh, we have seen this and I was saying that uh, this is the... the mm, uh, I mean, the, the later stage, the, rather than the 16th century of the, of the Portuguese presence in Brazil, this is the area in which the Portuguese began to settle, not in a continuous way, but we, we, within uh, central points. And this gives you another idea. Those are the definitive and present frontiers of Brazil. And those are two settlements that the Portuguese improved besides Guinea and the Atlantic Islands, they improved. And again, those are the definitions on the 19th century and not the portions of contact that the Portuguese had in the time. We are talking about mostly the 16th and the uh, 17th century. Uh, even so, this huge amount of contact points and settlements, one way or the other, show the networks of contact that the Portuguese had uh, established in, based in uh, maritime uh, expansion. So the first question I was saying that you usually put forward is when did, after all, this project, of, this idea of coming to India by sea began? That is subject to debate and during lots of time people would say that in the 15th century, uh, Henry the Navigator had already the intention to uh, arrive to India by ocean. And this has to do with the interpretations of some contents, of some documents, namely from the documents issued by the Pope. So, and there is this one in 1415, uh, which is a, a bullet, a bull, a Romanus Pontifex from the Pope, that it says, I'm going to try to translate it, um, believing that you, will, you would agree uh, or it would please God the, uh, with the, the greatest of these services if by its work and industry he would make the seas navigable until the Indians that are said to be also Christians and that way communicate with them and move them to help Christians against Muslims and others enemies of the faith. So based on this statement that refers the Indians that believe in Christianity people began to build the idea that in this stage uh, the Henry the Navigator had already the sense that it was possible to go to India by sea. But here you don't have in any moment saying that they will arrive by sea. What happens is that this idea that they didn't have an idea of this distance and when they began to arrive to uh, Morocco and farther down on the coast of Africa, they thought they would be very, very, very close to Ethiopia. And so they intended to arrive to those parts of India in which there were Christians. What means that that kind of interpretation that led so many historians to support the idea that yes, 
in 15th century Portuguese knew already that it was possible to circumvent the, the, the south of Africa and arrive to India. In fact, isn't it, it's not so. And there are other uh, quotations that uh, prove that. This is another one, 1479, and this is from a friar that says he is uh, a servant of the uh, noble and excellent and virtuous and whatever, the infant uh, Henry, which is Henry the Navigator, which found and notified all parts of Madeira and Azores, which are the Atlantic Islands, with all the coast of Guinea until the Indians. So, obviously in 1479, nobody had arrived to India. So this concept of India has nothing to do with the perception and conception of the Indian Ocean or the... Um, it's, it's just that kind of mental representations of the alterity and those who didn't fit in the European patterns was, were labeled with designations and names that then led historians to analyze things in a way that they thought they were referring to the inhabitants of India. But it is not possible at all. 1479, there was no way that no Portuguese had arrived to, uh, uh, to India, less yes by sea. So, uh, and then, I mean, this is, those are just the kind of documental analysis of things. We have much more arguments and reasons that led us to uh, support the idea that no, it is not possible, both for technical reasons, geographical reasons, because by that time, the Portuguese didn't have the knowledge and didn't have the means even to navigate on the South Atlantic and didn't really have the knowledge or the information that it was possible to arrive to the Indian Ocean circumventing the South of, um, of, of the African continent. In the other way, uh, they were questioning already how eventually to arrive to India by this time. So they were wondering, and what happens in the, uh, in the, thir the, the fourth uh, part of the 15th century, it is, is that there is a huge amount of trips in the Atlantic South. So they are trying, they are navigating south, they are navigating west, lots of sea ships have been lost, uh, lots of expeditions, we don't know which was the outcome of it, some of the expeditions we heard about when yesterday we just put the quotation uh, of, uh, of that the, the, of the um, Esmeraldo de Cito Orbis from Duarte Pacheco Pereira, the one that stated the existence of population in Amazonia, Brazil, and were comparing. So Duarte Pacheco Pereira was one of the navigators that intensely navigated in the South Atlantic. So in this context, we do have have these quests. We don't have the question, we, have the, we only have the answer. And this is the answer of Paolo Pozzo Toscanelli, and this was a clergyman but also an astronomist that answers a question that has been put forward to him by uh, agents of Lisbon municipality. And he says, the better way to the India of the smells and the, the, the gyms, as well as to go to Sipango and the wealth of Catayo, is not the one that you are following by Guinea, turning out Africa, turning back Africa, but it is just navigating straight ahead to west. So at this time, people were already configurating the possibility to navigate south, circumvent Africa and coming to India. And that's what Paolo del Pozo Toscanelli have said is not the right way. You just have to go west, which was the way followed by Christopher Columbus, uh, and uh, assuming that you would find India, which they would, <laughs> crossing America as they have done, which they, after all, have done. 
So, uh, we know that in 1488, the, uh, the south cap uh, uh, of Africa have been turned, but the navigations are kind of stopped, and only 10 years later, they re-began. So again, uh, historians quest, put queries, why was that so? After all, they found the way to go to the Indian Ocean. Why stop for 10 years? In fact, is that we have that kind of behavior also in the, the progress that I have talked about yesterday on the west coast of Africa. It is common that when they achieved to a nuclear point, they stop for a while, or at least we don't have registers in the documents for further experiments because every one of these travel was an adventure and it was an experiment guided by some orientations, obviously, by some uh, um, technical information, geographical information, but it was an experiment. So when you achieve a point, you have to consolidate your position before you go forward and keep going you have to know where you stand and you have really to consolidate all this and let's face it that arriving to the indian ocean as they knew they did was very challenging for by many points of view we have said that one of the advantages of portuguese was that they would know better how to navigate the atlantic ocean and they learn much more while navigating south but they certainly did know anything about navigating in the Indian Ocean. So there is a point of uh, uh, unknown, and there is obviously all the climatic and all the geomorphological and all the monsoon regime that has to be learned before they could really navigate it to the Indian Ocean. And then, so this is one thing, they have to have more information, they have to have more knowledge, and they have to know the calendar of the navigations, when they should go, when they should not. They have to collect information about politics, about economy, about geography. And they have to adapt also from a technological and nautical point of view. In terms of the orientation, it was the same as navigating south of the Ecuador. I mean, the great challenge for the, the Portuguese and European was that when they were uh, in the North Hemisphere, they had the North Star to guide them, them and to measure the latitude. While they achieved to the Ecuador, there was no more the North Star at the horizon. So they have to find other ways of guidance, one of which was to orient themselves by the sun. So they would, as they say, measure the high of sun at noon so they would know at what latitude they were. And then they discovered the, um, the, the star of the south, the cruise of the, the star, the cruise star of the south to navigate and orient them themselves in terms of latitude. So that was not really the problem. The problem was to understand the regime of monsoons, it was to understand uh, all the topographic uh, uh, characteristics of the coast, where it was to know where they could stop in order to refill their, their, their boats and their crews of uh, um, fresh products and so forth. The problem was security and the problem was as well the ships because the caravel was pretty much well adapted to the navigation uh, on uh, the high sea and on the Atlantic, but then if you want to go to India, you needed more robust ships, mostly because the trip would be much longer. So even to take the essentials in terms of food and drink and crew, and uh, replacement materials, because when you have problems on ships, you have to have wood on board, you have to have uh, um, uh, rope on board, you have to have sails on board. So all these logistics required much more. And more than that, if you are thinking of great amounts of commodities to bring 
back, you need bigger ships. So it was also an adaptation from this logistics point of view. And even if the uh, so-called now in Portuguese, Carac in English, was already known, it had to be improved. And it was improved uh, increasing significantly the tonnage, the volume of those ships. So those are some of the reasons that historians put forward to explain why to stop for 10 years. But there are other reasons which has to do with political secession. It has to, to be with the fact that John II was the king and he was a visionary king in, this, in the sense of the, the, the overseas expansion. He was the one that really called to the crown some directions of this movement. Uh, I told you that at the beginning it was m mostly just a head of private initiatives and private entrepreneurship. Except John II just tried to create some direction for these separate and individual initiatives. So, he was really a, uh, the first king that seemed to have articulated visions about, for instance, how do you articulate do, do what we do in Morocco with the, with the islands, the Madeira and the, and the Azores Islands, and with the slave trade in North Africa. So he began to build those networks of transference of communities that would enable and would feed each one of the directions of the Portuguese expansion. Except John II was married with a, a Spanish princess, but they had no children. They had no legitimate children, except he had another children, at least one more, uh, that he wanted to be the king. Except there was a huge reaction from the queen and from Spain against the idea that an illegitimate son of John II would be the inheritor of the, of, of the, of the, of the crown. So it was huge uh, complexity in terms of political negotiation and political dialogue. And then John II died, and then he died without inheritors. So it was, again, a debate who would be the successor of John II. And as uh, you remember, in the meanwhile, you have 1492, the discovery of America, and 1494, the Tordesillas Treaty. Okay? So it had to be a negotiation process, and it had to be a time in which diplomacy, in, uh, namely international diplomacy, would have to prevail in order to consolidate the position of the Portuguese in a moment in which the Spanish entered this scene, this uh, maritime uh, expansion and overseas uh, settlement. So all this seems to explain why there was a 10 years break between arriving to the Indian Ocean and, and then uh, really rebeginning another expedition ordered by the new king, Manuel I. Plus, that is very interesting in terms of the Portuguese society. For some sections, for some areas of the Portuguese society, India was not really a priority. Mostly because they didn't even understand which was this universe of the Indian Ocean. So there were, for instance, even in 1578, when I uh, told you yesterday there was this attempt to conquest Morocco in the Battle of Qadar um, al-Kibir, where the Portuguese army was totally defeated and the king died. So previous to that, there was debates in the parliament, in the courts, in Portuguese courts, and some representatives of the people would say, you just leave India alone, you just leave India and focus on Morocco. So. It was not consensual among the living forces, political and social forces in Portugal, where should the king or the crown invest with priority. So the idea of going to India was not consensual at the first time. Obviously, the merchants, obviously, the Italian communities, the foreign, the German communities, those foreigner communities that 
had lots of money that really had very intense commercial uh, and, and uh, trade interests, they were pressuring the king to invest in India, which is obvious. On the opposite, the Portuguese aristocracy, they lived mostly from war. So it is obvious that Morocco was the natural investment because they could make war, they could win territories, they could win administrative positions, political positions, they could have wealth taken from dead uh, possessions in uh, Morocco. So I think all this uh, uh, explains why it took so long to the Portuguese coming back again with the project of arriving to to India. And at the same time, these uh, circuits navigation were uh, being set in up. They were trying to understand which would be the best way to go down south and to get back to the north uh, without losing the ships in uh, in, in, in uh, all kinds of uh, problems that provoked it, shipwrecks and so forth. At the same time, also began to ha have a significant rivalry, namely first from the French. The French were always a kind of illegally accompanying the Portuguese. The British did as well. In Africa, in the coast of Africa, uh, there are the official settlements of the Portuguese, but at the same time, you have French merchants and uh, uh, British merchants that were trying to establish contacts with local populations. So even if not officially, that rivalry was on, uh, ongoing. So, but maybe we should go a little bit faster. We all know that obviously the Portuguese uh, wanted to participate in the intense trade they knew existed in the Indian Ocean, but they knew mostly from the result of those trade networks that would bring merchandise to the East Mediterranean, that would bring from this Red Sea and would bring from the Silk Road merchandise to the uh, East Mediterranean. And it was, they were mostly Italian uh, uh, merchant communities, the ones that would receive and would export, would distribute those products in Europe. So uh, that was well known. I mean, the books of Marco Polo in, in Asia, uh, they were known. They were known not of the total amount of population. I mean, it was just a few that would know the travels of Marco Polo or even the registers and the, the travel um, uh, nodes of some Italian merchants. But the fact is that that was not unknown. But most of all, uh, this was a very elitist trade. That was a trade that was dominated by the Italians by one way, and let's face it, that were, they were dominated mostly by the Venetian, from Venice, Venetian merchants. So you have Genoa, for instance, and Genoa was, they were the first merchant communities, the first and more active um, in, in Portugal. So what you have in the background of all these is that also the dispute be between Venetians and Genoese. The Venetians would really uh, have a better position in this East Mediterranean uh, trade, but the Genoese were trying through the Portuguese to get themselves a position which should be alternative, which should be uh, uh, a way to react to the Venetian dominance of the trade. So, uh, in terms of uh, chronology, let's just remember uh, that uh, between 1482 and 1488 there was those travels by Diogo Cão and uh, Bartolomeu Dias on the south coast of Africa and South Atlantic. In 1488 there was the crossing of the Cape of Good Hope by Bartolomeu Dias. In 1497 it was the departure of Vasco da Gama um, travel to India. 98 the arrival of Vasco da Gama in Calicut. 1505, Francisco de Almeida is appointed as the first viceroy of Portuguese India, and 
this is a kind of referential date to the creation of what would be called the state of India. The name, the concept, however, in itself, only begins to, be, to emerge in Portuguese documents in the second half of the 16th century. Uh, but in fact, the nomination of a viceroy impl implies the idea that the Portuguese crown wants to put a institutional representation and control of the Portuguese settlement in India. So it is a kind of referential date to the creation of the desired state of India. 1507, Afonso Alquerque captures the kingdoms of Ormuz in the Persian Gulf because obviously in the meanwhile what uh, was, was understood and it was not clear to the Portuguese is that the Muslim were still a very strong element and partner to dialogue with in the Indian Ocean. And they understood that not only they would be the maritime intermediaries connecting all these, uh, they were not the only players, but they were main players in these navigation circuits of the Indian Ocean. As they understood, they had settled some sultanates sultanados, the or, for political organization, both in East Africa and in India. So, and more than that, they understood that if they wanted really to guarantee the spice trade, they had to blockade the traffic here on the, by the Arabian Peninsula and avoid the traffic of the spices through the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. What means that? you have to secure both the entrance uh, of the, to, to the Red Sea and obviously a kind of create a barrier here to uh, isolate the Arabian Peninsula in order to avoid their contacts, their progressions and their uh, in the, I mean, intense navigation and trade activity. So the the capture, the intensive capture of the kingdom, the kingdom of Ormuz in the Persian Gulf was exactly one of these strategic way of creating blockade points in terms of the navigation um, of Muslims to, uh, in the Indian Ocean. So, uh, 1508, Afonso Alquerque is then appointed the second viceroy of India. As we know, he has been governor and then viceroy. 1510, the con conquest of Goa, and again, Goa. Goa, the positioning of Goa has everything to do, again, with that strategic position of being nearby the, um, the, the, the Red Sea, nearby the Gulf and Pers uh, the, the Persian Gulf, nearby the Arabian Peninsula. So it was not the choice of Goa was not a trading option, it was clearly a political option and a military option in terms of put the seat of the state of India in a place that would enable them to try to control the Muslim powers and their entrance in the, in the Indian Sea. Uh, even, let's face it, from a navigational point of view, Goa was a very difficult point and that's, that's why they would prefer Cushing as departure as logistics of the Carrera da India, of the Indian run, rather than frequently Goa. Uh, so Goa was clearly a political uh, option as well as the idea of conquering Goa. Uh, because as, we, as we, you know, and I think we are going to speak a little bit more about, there is several kinds of settlements. And those settlements, besides the, the juridical typology which you are going to talk about, they might, from a jurisdictional point of view, be established by sovereignty or essay to establish sovereignty, which means that they have the political command, they have the law, they have the official control, or suzerainty, in which you play influence, but you are not the official landlord. You are not the official 
political owner of that place, but you exert influence over it. So it's the difference between, as I say, um, and I apologize if there is any typo here, and um, I really don't know if they take sovereignty. It is an A. Okay. And I don't know if this word exists in English, suzerainty. It does. Okay. Um, so there is quite a difference between those concepts, and frequently the Portuguese exercise their influence over suzerainty and not over sovereignty. Uh, but obviously there are points when they conquest, they aim at sovereignty over those territories and influential areas. Okay, So uh, that's what happened with the decisions of the conquest of Goa and obviously uh, also of the conquest of, uh, sorry, of the conquest of Malacca. In 1512, the first European seems to appear in the Banda Islands. In 1513, George Alves seems to be the first European that landed in China. Um, and 1540s, I mean, this is an interrogation mark point, the first contacts of the Portuguese with Japan. In fact, 1540s, they are the first registers that mention the arrival of Portuguese in Chinese boats into uh, Japan. And uh, 1549, Francisco Xavier arrives to Japan. Obviously, they, this, those are selective chronological uh, marks, and you can assess, even in internet, at a much more detailed, uh, a much more detailed chronology that would help. But uh, basically, what I want is then to stress is this concept itself of the state of India, because this is not liquid that we all know what we're talking about. Sorry, I did. I don't have here the the, the translation. I thought I did. Uh, Louis Philippe Reistumage uh, defines very well, in my point of view, what he uh, think it is the state of the India, and he says that the state of the India is, in fact, the network that defines the presence of the Portuguese from the, the, the Cape of Good Hope until, the, until Japan, and it defines all kinds of official presence of the Portuguese in this vast territory, which is not territory, that is mainly sea, it is mainly a maritime surface, it is not so. This is an empire built, if we accept this concept of empire, because even when defining empires, and there are um, uh, journals that <laughs> they are in, uh, totally dedicated to debate what is empire, which, which is imperialism, which, what, what is colonialism. So the definition of itself of those concepts vary. And uh, even in Portugal, uh, it was quite hard to accept the concept of empire as defined to the Portuguese overseas uh, expansion. I can summarize a little bit this debate. It might be uh, interesting. When we speak in Portuguese, and when we talk of imperio, which is empire, we have several problems because, first of all, empire has to have a juridical status. And from a juridical point of view, you don't have any kind of empire in, in, the, in the West, rather than the Sacro-Roman Empire, which are the descendants of the Roman Empire, and which was basically established in of the emperor uh, in Austria. Okay, so it was the the Sacro-Roman Empire. There was the only 
imperator that was uh, put in possession by the, by the Pope. So by that point of view, you don't have any other kind of emperor. And in fact, only the Queen Victoria in the 19th century is going to call herself Empress. So, from this point of view, you don't have an empire, from a juridical point of view. Uh, then you can and go search other concepts of empires. And obviously, those concepts of empires, they are based on dominion, they are based on sovereignty, they are based of existing subsidiary political powers that obey to a main one. But when you speak of empires, you frequently, you are frequently also driven by the idea that they are territorial empires. They imply the conquest of land. They imply the uh, continual uh, and by warfare frequently an accession of territories. Okay, so. From this point of view, and obviously when you speak of an empire, you have to speak of a political structure that reflects in an administrative structure, that reflects in a military structure that defines this empire. So this, from this point of view, some Portuguese historians say it was not an empire. It was just a sum of possessions that were spread all over, and this presence didn't even have a single central structure that would rule them all. This is right and not totally right, because in fact, as for Portugal uh, is concerned, they have to go govern these possessions, colonization, empire, whatever we call, which is the concept we uh, apply. So, in the, by the central power or around the king, from the 15th century onwards, it was created a political and administrative structure that would support the decisions of the king towards these overseas possessions by one side, and that would, on the other hand, uh, provide the means, the logistical, the financial, the technical means to keep going with this expansion and the military means as well. So we cannot say that there was no any kind of structure around the Portuguese crown. Obviously it was. From a political point of view, we cannot say there were not established juridical structures of dominion because this state of the India with the nomination of a viceroy is clearly a way of a king sit in Lisbon, decide that I have an extension of my power and I have a representative and I have a state in India. It's uh, more or less the same when the governor in Brazil was nominated replacing all individual uh, captains. So, there is a setup, there is a structure, there is an administrative intent. And there is obviously a, a accumulation of settlements that frequently are acquired by force, by imposition. What the Portuguese did not have were that intensive poli politics of conquest that, for instance, the Spanish did in America, in Central and South America, what would be called Latin America. That is, is, is more easily assumed as being an empire because it was integrated by force and by war. But is this the only empire you can constitute, you can form? So that's why Charles Boxer comes with this idea that we are dealing with a maritime empire. This is an overseas, it's not an empire that was established uh, in Europe or uh, in continental bases. It is overseas and it is maritime in the sense that it was by sea that you establish all those connections. And let's face it, when 
we speak in English, and when I write in English, it is for me inevitable that I speak about the Portuguese overseas empire. <laughs> because it is a easy way, everybody knows what you are talking about. And then you can clearly establish the uh, kind of a comparison and parallelism with the British Empire, the Dutch Empire, the, the Spanish Empire. So it is for me inevitable. But in Portuguese, I avoid <laughs> to use the concept of empire and the concept of expansion or settlement or colonization, obviously. I have no doubt. In, from our point of view, there was a process of colonization, the creation of colonies, the establishment of dominion, and taking profit, obviously, of all that without the consent of the local populations, which are some of the ingredients of the, of the dimensions of the definition of empire. So, state of India. What is the state of India? Of the India? So, according to the definition of Luís Plis Tomás, the state of the India is the amount or is the, uh, is the total of the men, the goods, the territories, the factories, the fortresses that were under control of the Portuguese state of the India. So the state of the India would conform and would integrate all kinds of presence of Portuguese that were under the control of the Portuguese crown. And it was mostly a network of contacts. As you can see here, obviously there isn't any kind of uh, uh, continuous conquest of territory, but it is a network, a vast, a huge network of contacts throughout the, uh, the, the Indian and then the Pacific Ocean. But what it led us is to the idea that the sta state of the India is just a part of the Portuguese presence in the East or the Far East. What I want to say is that Japan was never part of the state of India. Okay? The Portuguese state of India, the viceroys, never had dominion or administrative or political control over Japan being by sovereignty or by suzerainty. And even so, the Portuguese were in Japan. The same in China. There was no Portuguese colonization in China. And even so, there was significant traders and missionary communities in China. So, these two dimensions, they don't naturally overlap. And the Portuguese presence in the East and Far East goes beyond the concept of the state of India. And uh, we know it uh, uh, as well. Um, we know it as well that, uh, for instance, even the state, sorry, even the state of the India that had its main seat in Goa tried to dominate and control uh, all the positions in the, in the Malabar coast. We know that, for instance, the Coromandel coast was by the opposite out of the control of the state of India. And that's why, again, both uh, uh, Indian historians and uh, Luis Felipe Restemais speak about the phenomenon of sub-colonization or even colonization out of the control of the state of India. It means that what happens is that you have that informal communities that are established aiming at their own profits and not obeying at all to the central structure of the state of India and not paying taxes to the, the structure of the state of India and not necessarily sending their commodities and merchandise through the Cape route to Lisbon. So some of them really settled 
they were wealthy, they established contacts, namely in the Bay of Bengal, with the local communities, the local merchants. They interfered directly and they participated in this, those trade routes, namely uh, with, uh, uh, with Malacca. And, but they didn't obey and they were not totally inserted in the structure of this state of India. And why is that so? Because by the beginning, from the beginning, there are many agents that are formally excluded from this idea of the state of the India. When someone by the king wrote, began to write, which was the, the means to come to India and how the India run had to be controlled, they for, totally forgot merchants. They don't even mer mention merchants, okay? They mention administrative personnel, king officers, they mention uh, aristocrats exercising military functions, they mention clergymen that would come, but they totally forgot, they, they mention soldiers, soldiers, obviously, but they don't even mention merchants. And that's why all this concept is a kind of mixed, even from the point of view of the Portuguese. Because, in fact, if trade was the main aim to come to India by sea, and it certainly was one of the main aims, then you don't have the professional agents that should take this trade uh, in a uh, considerable basis, which is the first and one of the main differences about with the Dutch or the British or the French, because they constitute trade companies, monopolistic trade companies that identifies, at least by its status and, uh, uh, and aims, that their main aim would be trade, even if we know that the British quickly evolved from this presence through a, a company, a trade company, to really a colonization process in which uh, the uh, uh, clear strategy of colonialism and the, the political presence of the United Kingdom uh, was in place. Okay, but the Portuguese, they began the other way around. They just forgot the traders in, in all this scheme. So those were a kind of excluded of the universe that was meant by the Portuguese and the Portuguese crown. It meant that even those that embarked to India in the, in the ships, lots of them were illegal were illegal because they didn't fit those categories that were foreseen and they didn't have authorization of the king to embark to India. And then there is the other reality that is going to inform all this. Lots of the seafarers and soldiers that embarked in the Caracks to India as seafarers and soldiers when they were in Indian or Indian, Indian Ocean world soil, they would become traders, obviously. They would become merchants. They would take all the opportunities that were offered to them in order to take benefit to their own. And so this, again, we are talking about the fuzzy world because the status of these, uh, of these men is not clear. Apparently, they were crew members. Lots of them didn't even get back to Lisbon because they would stay and settle here. They were soldiers. Okay, but while they were crewmen and soldiers, while they were in India, they would not be paid. So they have to find their own subsistence. And more than that, and this is one, I think it is uh, uh, some well-known fact, uh, one of the things that explains the rates of non-collaboration of the, the Portuguese the seafarers with the crown was that the crown did not pay in time or did not pay at all or did not pay while it was required to. For instance, they would keep a great deal of the payment 
to when they would return to Portugal in order to assure that they would return. Um, and uh, I mean, I deal with uh, uh, documents of the municipal notary records, for instance, and sometimes four years after the trip, the seafarers are asking, demanding the king through a third person to go to Lisbon to please collect the money that the crown owns if from the trip he has done to, uh, to Goa on four years ago and they identify who was the captain, who was the shipmaster, who was... And four years later, they didn't have yet the money. So it means that, obviously, they had to find other means of subsistence and they had to keep all the opportunities to get profit from it. Obviously, the king himself, the crown itself, would offer um, half an hour. I have to go faster. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the king himself would offer privileges to those seafarers in order to convince them to join. And as you know, we have this idea that this was the monopolistic trade with, uh, with the East, with India, in the India run. Yes, it was on spices and all in all kinds of uh, mineral, um, gold and silver and so forth. But there is a huge amount of merchandise, of commodities that were not monopolistic. You can trade uh, tapestries, you can trade um, China, you can trade, I mean, semi-precious uh, jewelry, you can trade all of them. So we cannot imagine that everything was monopoly of the crown. There is a rate of trade that could be done by um, particulars. And but more than that, to the, to the crew, they were con conceded what they called, I would not know how to translate it in English, quintaladas. And uh, quintal is a measure. Um, I OK. Quintals of what? Of merchandise that should be forbidden <laughs> to them to bring. They could bring some portion of spices, they could bring slaves, they could bring some kind of merchandise that were monop monopoly of the king. Obviously, they have to pay taxes when they arrive to Lisbon, but even so, they were allowed to participate in this business. So we, which dilutes a lot the idea of the, that everything was monopoly of the crown, because the crown considered itself as a privilege, as a retribution, uh, the possibility of getting in this kind of trade also if they would arrive to Lisbon and pay. What I mean is that there is a huge amount of uh, opportunities for these people just to interfere with the networks of trade that were in place and do it outside the control of the agents and representatives of the state of the India. So you do have a huge amount of circumstances that uh, keeps you... Um, okay, we go to the other one keeps you uh, away from the control of the state of India and brings the Portuguese presence into, in the East much more extended than the presence of the state of India. And obviously all this world that we are talking about, that was complex enough, gets even more complex when you have the Spanish entering by the Americas and when you have the Spanishes entering in uh, Oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't even realize. Uh, when you have the Spanish enter, entering by the Philippine and the Manila run. So the Portuguese had to share also this territory with the Spanish and they established themselves complex networks of collaboration also, mainly with the connection between the Philippines and the Macau in the, uh, in the East. Then we all know that not suddenly, not suddenly, but from the late 16th century, you have other players entering in the, this game. 
So you have the Dutch, you have the British, you have the French that from the late 16th century officially came in the, this space and began to dispute the Portuguese all these uh, territories. And it is obvious that the Portuguese were able to keep uh, for some time some territories, namely Malacca, that was menaced but not taken by the Dutch. They were able to keep uh, Macau, they were able to keep Goa, the Mão, Diu, but most of the other possessions they would lost to the other European players. Does it mean that the presence of the Portuguese diminished or disappeared in the East? No, it doesn't. Because that's this idea that beyond the structure of the state of the India was those informal, illegal, recognized and not recognized connections of those networks of individuals that were firmly established in the East and established firm connections with networks uh, uh, of traders, of merchants, of uh, uh, landlords, because some of those Portuguese were not merchants, but they were soldiers, or they were soldiers, and they were merchants, and they were seafarers, and they were these multifunctional profiles that they had also in Portugal, it's not new, so you have them, uh, this interpenetration in the world, and you still have today manifestations of that in terms of military architecture, in terms of material culture, in terms of names of people, in terms of, of linguistic terms of the uh, Portuguese. So, but rather than that, I would like, and okay, this is the, the expression of how quickly the Portuguese were replaced by the Dutch and mostly here by the French and the British in India. But this is, as I say, a story that you know better than me. So let's now try to have another perspective of this, of this world, which is society the colonial society. Okay. I can? Okay, so I will breathe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because after when we will have the, the, the time. Okay, here you are, the definition I was speaking about uh, according to Luis Philippe Reis Tomás. So he says, the state of India in the 16th century designated a collection, the word itself, a collection of territories, establishments, assets, individuals and interests that were administrated, managed or governed by the Portuguese crown in the Indian Ocean and neighboring seas and the coastal territories from the Cape of Good Hope to Japan. I think this is a very good definition because it, uh, even Luis Felipe Ristomás doesn't speak about power or dominion or political influence. Mm -hmm. He speaks about of all these kind of all these kind of things, territories. And he says it is a collection. As you can imagine, a collection is when you put together several pieces. It's not a continuous, it's not an homogeneous thing. It's just put one after the other. So it is a collection of establishments, assets, individuals under Portuguese control, assets, uh, sorry, interests, and then you have all forms of juridical uh, control, administration, management, and govern, govern, or government, if you want to. We are going to talk about in a while. By the Portuguese crown, and obviously all this network of contacts that go goes from the the the, the Cape of Good Hope to uh, Japan. So, what we have here in this concept of the state of India, we have this heterogeneity of the concept. It's not something clear or univocal, it's heterogene. We have a vast territorial extension from the Cape of Good Hope to Japan, which is not territories, it's mostly sea or seas. We have 
territorial discontinuity. This is not an empire taken by uh, army force or conquest continuously. No, it is not. It is a network of maritime hubs. It is a communication system. And this word, communication, is paramount. Because the presence of the Portuguese depended on information, depended on communication, depending on the access to the news and the information about the markets about the trade circuits, about maritime rounds, about the agents that were involved. But it is also a huge heterogeneity of strategies of settlement and dominion, as we are going to see, and it is an heterogeneity, it implies a heterogeneity of the institutional and juridical uh, frameworks. So, in general terms, this concept points to the interest that were official governed by the crown, but it does not coincide, nor does it exhaust the much broader notion of the Portuguese expansion or the Portuguese presence in the Indian Ocean. So, this is because the Portuguese presence also covers the non-official models of settlement. And that's here that we are get, getting again to the self-organized and informal networks, because these non-official modes of settlement, which developed regardless of the state of the, uh, of, the, of the India, and in some cases, even against the state of India. So, I'm, I'm afraid I'm using the Portuguese names of the territories. Um, so, ways of settlement of dominion, the heterogeneity I was talking about. You have military conquest, as a means it happens in Goa, Malacca, or Mos. Even if Hormuz ended up to a kind of surrendered in, in a negotial basis, was not really conquest. You have peace treaties that were established, for instance, in Basaim, in Bardej, in Salsete, in the periphery of Goa. You have local landlords' wills. For instance, in Ternat and Selam, and the, the, the local leaders were converted to Christianity and in their wills they left the sovereignty to the Portuguese by short periods of time, but even so it was like that. You have voluntary acceptance, just like in Timor. In Timor you don't have war, you don't have any treaty, you don't have any, for, any formal way of settlement or acceptance. It was just a voluntary or, I mean, spontaneous acceptance of the Portuguese. We don't know if it was voluntary or involuntary. We don't have news or acknowledgement of resistance, reaction, but it was a interaction that ended up in a settlement. You have those fortresses that we are talking about, and they are mostly in Malabar Coast, Kuchim, Kananor, Kolam, Krangrenor, Kaligut, Shoal, Ternat, and many others, what goes in favor of what you were yesterday stressing, the idea that the Portuguese privileged a lot the building of fortresses. And then you have uh, uh, de facto possession. They really took possession, for instance, in the west uh, coast of Africa, in uh, Sofala and uh, Mozambique, and in some of the eastern highlands of Insul India. And for instance, Mozambique uh, began to be a kind of a negotiated presence, and then it was a forceful presence taken by the Portuguese that included the Mozambique and uh, the Mozambique Highland in uh, the state of India. Then you have trade factories, as it happens in Muscat, uh, Kalayat, Batikala, and the, the Biznaga Kingdom, Pasein. So factories, there are other kinds of organization. You have eminent dominion of the Portuguese, what means that we are talking about some kind of sovereignty that is established by the Portuguese uh, in that some of those um, and some of them posts. And then you have circumstances in which Portuguese pay fees 
to the local landlords in order to be accepted as a community or their presence to be accepted as a whole. So they pay fees to like a launder, as it happens in some parts of the Malabar coast or in Siam in which Malacca was, in fact, a subsidiary uh, political area of the uh, kingdom or emperor of Siam. And then you have the Japan and China cases, which was not, doesn't fit in any of those. They didn't have, OK, uh, Nagasaki, they, at the end, uh, were, have the possibility to have a kind of a factory controlled also by the Japanese where they could land their merchandise, but it was not a factory dominated or controlled by the Portuguese. The Jesuits did in some extent, but in China, obviously, and namely in Canton, the paradise of the Europeans, they were all, until the 18th century, controlled by the local authorities. And in Canton, those European merchants could not be some parts of the year. That's why they would move to, to, to Macau. And so they have, obviously, to uh, respect and to obey the local ruling where they would be. So this is difficult for us to establish a pattern of comprehension and interpretation of what would be the state of the India and what would be the colonization process, if there is one, of the Portuguese in India. And that's why sometimes we use and prefer to use the Portuguese presence in the Indian Ocean or Portuguese presence in the Pacific Ocean. However, this is a kind of tricky from an historiographical point of view. Because if we say so, we might be not acknowledging that a great deal or a part of this process was not a voluntary acceptance process, was really imposed by force. And we know there was means, uh, even to the, domination, the dominating the, the seas, uh, we all know that the Kirtanza system was a forceful, way to dominate the seas. So we cannot just uh, 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 feed or take this interpretation that it was the Portuguese war on the Indian Ocean as like it was so many other uh, um, agents, so many other representatives of other political forces because it was a uh, dominion, a forceful presence and an imposed presence uh, bring by the Portuguese artillery and the Portuguese privateering and the Portuguese regime of Cartazes. What would bring the idea, as you know, it was, per it was per perfectly accepted in the Mediterranean that the dominion of, the, uh, of a sea, of a uh, water surface, and it was war at the sea, or warfare at the sea, determined the Roman Empire, for instance, destinies, and obviously the Greeks and the Phoenicians, and from the antiquity, the warfare at sea in the Mediterranean was a reality, and obviously when the Portuguese arrived to the Indian Ocean, in which the Indian Ocean was mostly a space of circulation of, of ideas, of cultures, of commodities, and so forth, they imposed uh, the minion logics by the using force, using war force, using artillery, using bigger and bigger and bigger carracks that are what fortress at the sea. Again, the concept of a fortress. Uh, so even the f the, the first carracks they were small or medium sized. Then the Portuguese began to build bigger and bigger and bigger carracks that were over a thousand tons of volume. When I'm speaking of tons, I'm, to I'm talking about um, volumetry, so volumetric measures and not uh, weight measures. So those fortress on the sea, they obviously were a way of dominion, just like the fortress and land were a symbol of power of the Portuguese. So. Is this colonialism? Is this settlement? It is this maritime dominion? Is this a Portuguese presence in the East? 
I think, and for us, is extremely important all the historiography which is produced in, the, uh, in India and uh, in the Indian Ocean in general, uh, because we do have the other perspective. And we do have those complex ideas that obviously the Portuguese dominated, but the Portuguese had mostly to negotiate. And if there is a world in which negotiation is paramount, was certainly the Indian, uh, the Indian Ocean. So we do have to understand the specific realities of the different and specific components of the Indian world in order to understand the mechanisms of negotiation and the mechanisms of cooperation that would put, for, would put forward. And that's why, in this sense, studying the local is more important than studying the global, because there is not a global pattern here. And what happened in Goa is not what happened in Malacca, is not what happened in, in some of the Indonesian islands. So uh, what we have, getting a little bit back, we have uh, the establishment of some structures of political dominion. The state of India, administrative setup, viceroys, governors, crown administratives, financial and military officers were established in Goa. We have municipal councils. We have uh, this, those municipalities which have, are a copy of what the Portuguese had in their uh, own country, in metropolis. They emulate, they, they just copy the same model in Portugal uh, and they constituted other nodes of structural network responsible for the organization of the Portuguese presence in the East, because you have municipalities all over. You have a municipal in Macau, you have municipalities in, 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 in Goa and all the other uh, settlements. Then we usually forget this kind of networks that are also established, the misericordious house. Are you familiar with this? No, not really. I will explain a little bit better. So, the Misericordia House is a confraternity, or if you prefer, a brotherhood. A civil brotherhood. The church obviously has influence on it, but it is not uh, administrated or ruled by the church, the Catholic Church. They are civilian organizations that are meant to give uh, social support to give social assistance to those who are more um, fragile. The sick people, the widows, the orphans, the prisoners, the, okay, this is the first kind of social, it's not social assistance that in Portugal have been put forward. They are communities, organized communities of citizens. If the concept can be applied to this period of time, uh, they have usually lots of money because they give of donations. They give of uh, money and prop property that are given to them by wills or by donations. They are, they are rich, they are wealthy, they have lots of power and they have influence. And they were established all over Portugal and then they were established all over the overseas maritime empire. So you have Misericordias in um, Macau, in Malacca, in Goa, in Cochin, in Africa, in Brazil, all over Brazil. So they happen to constitute as well a formal network of Misericordias. And they were very important because, for instance, let's imagine someone died in China. His goods, the remaining goods, were sold and the money was sent to the Misericordia of Malacca. And then the Misericordia of Malacca would send it to uh, the south of Macau. The Misericordia of Macau would send it to the Misericordia of Malacca. The Misericordia of Malacca would send it to Goa. Goa would send it to Lisbon. And Lisbon would send it to wherever Misericordia was in Portugal, wherever it was the small village of... So this kind of network is not an official crown network, but it was essential to make these connections of the empire work in terms of social and uh, capital mobility and uh, the wheels, for instance, they would arrive at Portugal in a great extent to this Misericordia's house. 
actions. And then obviously you have what they called the Portuguese Padroado, uh, which is the ecclesiastic organization. Uh, you have dioceses and you have the missionaries, you have the missions. And in both the Portuguese king and the Spanish king were given by the Pope the right to organize these ecclesiastical structures. What means that? In principle, it should be only the ecclesiastic structure that should govern this structure. If you are not following me, please just tell me. In this case, the Pope gave the kingdoms of Portugal and Spain the right to organize themselves and to govern themselves this kind, this kind of ecclesiastical structure. What means that obviously these miss the missions and the missionary structure became as well a tool of colonization and a tool of acculturation. And even traveling to the east of the Jesuit priests and Franciscan priests and so forth dependent, the, uh, were dependent or depended on the authorization of the crown. This gave the, the, the crown power and it gave the crown the kind of network, formal network, that it didn't have in all the territories. Because, for instance, in Japan there was no an administrative crown set up but there was Jesuit missions that answered to the Portuguese crown and the Portuguese padroado of India, the patronage, the king patronage of uh, uh, India. So then you have, so this, those are to some extent structures of political dominion or structures of political control. Those are the ways that the Portuguese crown had to uh, extend its control and influence over the, uh, over the East. And let's face it, this is the, the missions, for instance, are the missions are as important as this crowned administrative and those financial and military officers because the missions were spread all over this huge network of contact points and they were agents of acculturation. And obviously when we speak about colonization, one of the main elements of colonization is acculturation, is try to transform the local culture to a model that would coincide with this external imposed model in terms of religion, in terms of language, in terms of way of uh, dressing, way of uh, addressing. So this acculturation process is as important, if not more, than the military dominion and the economic dominion. And again, these acculturation processes is a way of, these acculturation processes are ways of globalization, even if they are imposed. Because what you have is a model that is transferred to other spaces and it is voluntary or involuntarily absorbed and replicated in another part of the world. And the Coca-Cola or the McDonald's is an example, as it should be that influence of the Portuguese Misericordias in the 16th century. They are the same kind of globalizing patterns, being of consumptions, being of acculturation. And obviously, acculturation implies for the Portuguese, for the European, but mostly for the Portuguese and the Spanish, mostly the conversion to Christianity because it was also in Portugal. It was not only here. Let's face it, uh, for the Europeans, the Christianism is not only a religion in the sense of a religious codal doctrine. The Christianism has obviously a dogma, has its own theology, but it has its ethos, the ethical code, it's an ethical code. 
and it is a pedagogical way of teaching and learning. So it is a pedagogy, it is an ethics, it is a, a doctrine, it is a dogma, it is a theology. So it is a global setup that really uh, uniformizes behaviors. And that's obviously what the structures want, it is to uniformize and control. And uh, obviously we do know that in the second half of the uh, 16th century there was the religious reformations in Europe and you have all kinds of confessions, Christians confessions still, so we have the Catholic Church that remains, but then you have the uh, Protestant Church being them Anglican or being then Lutherans or Calvinists or so they are different confessions but the ethos is still the same. And uh, even if the, uh, the Roman uh, Catholic religion and structure would still much more um, proselytic in the sense of wanting to conquer, it doesn't mean that the other confessions, Christian confessions, didn't have the same aim of acculturation. It is true, and you would eventually agree with me, that the impact of the Catholic missions on the East was much more visible, was much more uh, um, profound rather than the Calvinist pastors' actions during or under Dutch control. But the acculturation process was there, and let's face it, even the, the, the Calvinist missionaries, they were under the payment and the orders of the VOC, the, the company, and they would create schools. And there is no other better way of acculturation rather than teaching, than, rather than those structural way of uh, educating people, not only teaching them how to write other languages, but how to integrate and absorb other patterns of behavior. Uh, so uh, I would say that we are talking always in uh, networks, uh, whatever we are talking about the state control, the local power control, the misericordious networks or the padroados networks that included the, the missions. So, but you have obviously the economic the structures of dominion and the economic structures of the dominion become with the crown monopolies. We talked a little bit about it uh, already. Uh, it is a, a reductionist way of seeing things. They say that all the trade with the East was, monop was crown monopoly. It was not. It was not legally and obviously it was not illegally because the amount of illegal trade, of uh, smuggling that was ongoing was such that certainly there was not a monopoly and the monopoly official one was established only with spices and uh, gold and uh, silver, so precious metals. Then you have uh, those trade concessions to some companies and individuals, so the crown would give a privilege to. Then you have the privateering as the way of dominion of the seas and the cartazes system which you know well. Only those who have a specific authorization of the Portuguese, it means they were there alive and they paid them uh, uh, any kind of retribution or fees were able to circulate on the Indian Ocean. So this is here the introduction of a total new, totally new concept of dominion of the seas by force and this idea that you can own the sea uh, to own power that was obviously the main way of dominion of this very vast network we're talking about. And then we have this policy, this is very important from the Portuguese point of view, a policy of grace and mercy that were given by the crown agents to the noblemen or the crown officers. Basically, what we have is this concept that everything belongs to the king because he was a kind of given all his power by God. So, 
he is the one that distributes mercies, that acknowledges the credits and the merits of the others, giving them privileges. So what we have in Europe, in the well called Ancien Regime, this early modern age, as we call it in Portugal, is a hierarchized society uh, that is acknowledged by law. What means that by law, this society is unequal. It's not equal, there is no any kind of equality, not even in juridical terms, is unequal. But even so, there is social mobility, and one of the ways of this social mobility is, is the, the king conceding citizens or I mean, individual agents some privileges, some mercies. So, here in the East, as in uh, the Europe or in Morocco, it was not it was not really the merits or the individual value or the performance of an individual, but it was the recognition of that by the king that would give a privileged position of a person within a setup. Okay? And obviously it created for lots of conflicts within that community and obviously it created a distorted society also in the East and I don't know if the not yet but okay uh, let's leave it uh, it created a distorted society in which, which was dominated by noble men and noble women so the aristocracy and this aristocracy were given privileges except those privileges were economic or financial privileges. So they were awarded with the right to collect the taxes of the custom house of Cochin. Okay? So they were educated to be noblemen, to be warriors, to be whatever, and suddenly they are really on trade. They have huge amounts of money that they are going to employ on trade. So you don't have professional-minded merchants, you have people that have other kinds of codes of behavior and education and so forth, and suddenly they are in the business world. So the way they are going to spend the money, it is influenced by the way they have been educated. And it applies here in the East, as it applies in Portugal, in Europe. And one of the main ways of these uh, people being recognized is showing their wealth. So, lots of horses, lots of guns, lots of slaves, lots of houses, lots of representatives around them. What I mean is that this is, during lots of time, this was the only explanation for the unsuccessful uh, financial so uh, situation of the Portuguese Empire. This is not the only explanation, but this is one of them. Those men and women, they are not minded to business. So frequently, instead of reinvesting their benefits, they spend their benefits. And you can imagine that what does it mean? It means that you are not feeding your business. You are not really minded in terms of building consistent companies, replicating your profits, controlling the benefits and reinvesting them in a bigger business, it means that you are losing part of that and you don't reinvest them in business again. So this society you are talking about is different, quite different from the economic mentality of the Vogue or of the uh, East India Company of the British or those representatives have one mission and they were oriented some of them were also uh, noblemen, let's face it, but their mission, their function, their duties, they were established according a business-minded action, which is not the case of most of the Portuguese Asians. So, I'm not going to explain this because, as again, again, you know it, uh, you know it already well. The very important thing is that uh, when you say, and even in Portugal, we say the Portuguese in India. Okay, the Portuguese in India, but rather than India, what sustained the Portuguese in the East was not their presence in India, was their ability to interconnect with this inter-Asian trade. 
So this is again two contentious uh, schools of thought in Portugal in terms of historiography. Some says, oh, from the, 16, uh, the, the second half of 16th century, uh, there was already a decline of the profits of the Portuguese in India. And some say, oh, no, no, not at all. The 16, all the 16th and 17th century, they were a huge amount of wealth among, among the Portuguese communities in the East. And I would say both are true. Because what was in some instances in crisis and declining profits was the India run, I mean, the amount of money that arrived in Lisbon was in fact less, the profits were less, because the investments, the crown investments in the India run were bigger, there was privateering, there was shipwrecks, there was a certain factors, there was the diminishing of the quantity of, of spices arriving on the European markets, there was the decreasing of the prices of the spices in European markets, so yes, from 15, 1570, 1580, we, the indicators we have is that the Portuguese crown is wanting less with the commodities that arrive in, uh, in Europe. Because they are investing more, because they are losing uh, some ships because of the privateering and the piracy and so forth. But when we analyze this from the Eastern point of view, the money that would circulate here and the commodities and the profits among the Portuguese, they were wealthy. Obviously, they were wealthier than they have been in the beginning of the presence of the Portuguese presence in the East. At a point in which it was the crown that was asking money, namely to the merchants of Goa, when there was financial crisis of the crown. So there was those individuals that were giving money, lending money to the crown because they had it and because they had, and that was because they clearly knew how to interact and intermingle in this very active and wealth uh, inter-Asiatic uh, trade. So, economic integration, the inter-Asian circuits are a paramount in order to understand the presence of the Portuguese and the wealth of the Portuguese. And obviously, both uh, arrival to the insul India area, to the South uh, East Asia, Ternat, Tidor, as well as Malacca, and obviously the arrival at Macau, and uh, namely at the Canton fairs, that gave the Portuguese direct access to silks, porcelain, tapestries, precious stones, aromas and drugs, besides the carnation or the nutmeg that were directly bought and they directed, interfered with those markets. Which is obvious then, then when we speak of the Portuguese in the East, we cannot speak but the Portuguese in the East and Far East, because at uh, a great extent, they handed up to influence the, uh, all these areas of the East. Uh, I would say that if we go again from a Portuguese point of view, Afonso de Albuquerque is a contentious, is a contentious, is a kind of a, hero uh, in Portuguese historiography, but at the same time, because he was very, from an operative point of view, from a logistic point of view, he was clever in the sense that he knew what he had to do, he understood the mechanisms and he, he acted, he performed. And it was exactly that who took him to, to, took him to be removed of this post because he was taking decisions without the king's permission. And obviously we can understand that. You can ima imagine what it is to make the diagnosis of a situation today. And then you send letters to the king and they take nine months to arrive there. 
and then the king will listen for some people and takes two months to take a position to that or one month, whatever. He has to wait the next monsoon career to send back his instructions to say do this or do that. In the meanwhile, one and a half years at least, if not two years, passed by and the decision of the king is not anymore the appropriate decision, which is obvious. So, this lack of autonomy with a so far away uh, space and territory is obviously a main uh, drop down, uh, a, a, a main problem to uh, efficient government if one wants to control, to interfere, not even to, dom to dominate, but to, to interfere, to be a player and to be a successful player. And obviously, Afonso Alquerque was a successful player in its terms, except he was taken down by his rivals, obviously. And then we do have this idea of Goa. And as you know, and as I have seen, <laughs> when I come to India, uh, when I say I'm Portuguese, everybody says, oh, Goa. Because the Goa <laughs> is obviously the symbol of the Portuguese presence. Uh, and obviously today we still go there, and I didn't believe until I felt and I, see, I saw it, and you can clearly see it in the architecture, in the material culture, in the, the, the names, the onomastics of the people, in, even in the fact that some people speak Portuguese. But the fact is that I have several PhD students that came from Indonesia, they, they came from uh, Thailand, they came from, and their studies on the Portuguese presence is, for me, impressive. So, what I can say is that, yes, let's talk about, Go about Goa, this is inevitable, but I think that any one of you, as we have, se have seen yesterday when we were proposing some topics, can acknowledge, in fact, some registers of some impact of the Portuguese outside Goa. But that's clear that Goa was the administrative, political and fiscal capital, but it was also the religious and cultural center of the Portuguese empire in the East. So, Goa was not just the capital of the Estado da Índia, but it was what lots of authors call him, the Rome of the East. <laughs> and when we go today to the old Goa, it is exactly that perception we do have. Is Okay, it is a, a, a totally abandoned <laughs> Rome, but it is Rome. It is even from an architectural point of view, you have the replications of the patterns that were dominating in the West and obviously in Rome. So, Goa was really seen as the Rome of the East, with all that, what that could signify, both in religion terms and in terms of cultural cosmopolitanism. Because just like Rome was the center of the Christianity of, Goa became really the center of this cosmopolitan presence, not only of Western, but of Eastern patterns, cultural, artistic, aesthetical, uh, that intermingled. So Goa was, in fact, a crossroads of diver diverse worlds and various civilization. And the European world, which imposed its presence by the use of symbolic forms of supremacy and dominion, was just one. Because obviously the Hindu world and Islamic world were equally paramount in Goa. And if we make any kind of studies, in terms of science, for instance, if we go and study the functioning of the Goa hospital, if we go and study uh, what we call the Jesuit um, pharmacopoeia, uh, the medicines, uh, the kind of uh, the, the list of medicines they would have, we can see again all this kind of syncretism, of synchronism between different influences and different civilizations. We can see that most of the medical personnel were local. We can see that lots of the medicines were made with local um, um, 
protocols, let's say, local indications and protocols. So what I mean is that we used to see uh, Goa as the center of this state of India, of the Portuguese presence, but it was a place of this huge cosmopolitanism and the syncretism that we have also to acknowledge. Obviously, missionary activities converged in Goa as the seat of the Portuguese Padroado in the East, but uh, at the same time it was the seat of the official power. Both factors ensured that Goa had an um, easily discernible cultural dynamism, of course. Um, but let's read again Luis Felipe Tomás. And he says, in Goa, the intellectual traditions of the Brahmins of yore intersected with the religious order's passion for letters, present in full force in a territory that thought to be the Rome of the East. But again, the author is stressing this symbiotic convergence between the Christian patterns, cultural patterns, and the Brahmins cultural patterns as well. So the role of the locals as intermediaries and as agents of the Portuguese settlement, they are essential. And that will be the topic of the next session. I didn't finish yet. Um, uh, it will be the topic of the next session in which we are going to talk about women in the, in the Portuguese overseas expansion and spending some time, just a few, um, uh, on this idea of the, the, the role of intermediaries, among which women were main elements of connection. They work of brokers and betweens. Okay, this is the famous cartographic representation of uh, Goa. Um, and the, the idea that Goa was the head of all India. And obviously, this uh, can be uh, seen by the testimonies of uh, Pirard de Laval, uh, of uh, um, other travelers that were on the East that describe precisely the magnificence of Goa, the buildings of Goa, the urban order of Goa, the, which is obviously a impos uh, an imposition, which is in fact it is the importation and an imposition of an external model to uh, make it be identified with a power which was the Portuguese uh, colonial uh, power. So we can uh, uh, just uh, go through it. Go, uh, that Pirard Laval highlighted the city's monumental nature, emphasizing that Goa, and I quote, has a large number of fortresses, churches, and houses built in European style with excellent stone and tiled roofs. The Portuguese have been able to construct many super, super buildings or ch of churches, monasteries, palaces, fortresses, and other structures in the European fashion. And similarly, they have established good order, regulations, and security, and have acquired a great deal of power there, since everything there is maintained and upheld as thought it was in Lisbon itself. So it is clearly the concept of a colonial order. You are going to replicate what you have in a metropolis to a space that has nothing to do with it in terms of geomorphology or climate or culture or whatever. So, and this obviously, this is an European reading it. And obviously, the most important things that this is in Goa is what replicates what the knowledge is in Lisbon or in Paris or whatever. So, this. Those are precisely uh, the marks of that order and magnificence that we're talking about. And, but Goa was really an uh, important uh, cultural center uh, also for the uh, Portuguese. And then, as for teaching and education in Goa, in 1541, the Santa Fe Brotherhood instituted a seminary to train indigenous clergymen, which was entrusted to Jesuits in 1541. 43. There we go, acculturation, and uh, obviously education is the main one, and the education of the local clergy is obviously an important thing. Again, 
we have to, 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 to uh, underline some differences, uh, for instance, between the Portuguese and the Dutch. In the Dutch case, uh, they used the tools, sent them to Europe rather than form them in place. What means that this is a strategy and they think it is a much better acculturation process, just taking people to Europe mm, and uh, uh, educating them according to. In 1545, Dom João de Castro created parish schools which taught Portuguese, the Christian doctrine and religious music. The St. Paul's College was founded in 1557, run by the Jesuits and the St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas College, overseen by the Dominicans, began to award university degrees from 1584 onwards. If you have the uh, awarding of your university degrees, you can be sure that you have here an elite an elite, reproductive elite, you have a colonial society which is asking for a better education. And since they don't want or they cannot go to Portugal to have it, and some of them do, that what you do is that you begin to award that kind of high education awards so to this elite that is requiring it. The importance of these training and education centers modeled in European institutions were recognized by means of significant financial endowments provided by the political uh, authority. And then if we go through the budget of the Estado da India, we certainly see a significant amount of money, sums that are given to those cultural and teaching institutions. And in 1556, a printing house was created also in Goa. Again, uh, showing the importance of the local production, intellectual production. And uh, it doesn't mean then that the books were then circulating in Europe. We can just speak about the book of uh, um, Garcia de Horta. The, that was printed in Goa, I think it was in 1560. Um, so it was a pharmacopoeia, it was a, a medicine and pharmacy book that was very popular all over Europe, but it was printed in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom by the, by the time, in France, it was printed in Northern Europe, but it was not printed in Portugal, even if the first time it was printed was in Goa. <laughs> And it was not because Garcia da Horta, Horta was a new Christian. There we go again <laughs> to the new Christian uh, reality. But he came in uh, a kind of the accompanying a, a viceroy, a governor, in fact. The governor was part of his uh, committee. Uh, but the fact is that he was then, he and his family was taken by the networks of the Inquisition. And again, in 1560, it was created the Inquisition of Goa. Uh, it's very important to note that there was never an Inquisition of Brazil, for instance. I mean, it was the Inquisition of Lisbon that used to deal with the processes and the, visit, the, the visits in Brazil or in overseas territories. But there was an Inquisition in Goa. It means that the Portuguese crown acknowledges the complexity, the importance, but it was also because of the distance, obviously. It was very, very far away uh, from, from Lisbon. Okay, you have, I'm going to finish in three, two minutes. You certainly have a, a colonial society, namely in Goa, that has some criteria. Obviously, the first criteria is religion. Either you are a Christian or you are not a Christian. Then it is race. The color of your skin obviously interferes with that. So you have to be white to be at the top of the social scale. Then you have social status. So the nobleman, the aristocracy will be obviously. Then you have to have also economic status, but the social status come obviously first. And then you have a full definition of hierarchies that depended on your direct connection with Europe. So any 
Reynal, and Reynal was the one just arriving from the kingdom, was in a better position, was more considered rather than the castiços, which were Portuguese as well, descendant of Portuguese of European in second generation, but they were living here in the second generation, so their status was less important in terms of hierarchical terms rather than those just arriving from the, the Portugal. And then you have obviously those resulting from the mixed breeding, from the uh, metis, the, the, the mestizos, the one that combine different uh, 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 genetic combinations. And obviously cultural and knowledge be, it was also a criteria of social, um, social um, hierarchy. I will stop because I have to stop, but okay. Oh yes, tomorrow we'll speak about the Casados. I think we'll have, we will have the opportunity. Oh God, it was still lots to do, but it's time to stop. Yes, if you don't, if translation is not required.